applause should not the applause should not be for me, but from for the good men who are getting the technology running here. Good evening. I'm Father Thomas Fama, Vice Rector of Academic Affairs at the University of St. Mary the Lake, and I have the honor of acting as the Master of Ceremonies for this year's Albert Cardinal Meyer Lecture Series. Let me begin by telling you uh, a couple of things about this wonderful building. The Cardinal Mundelein Auditorium is the last of the original buildings here on campus. Completed in 1939, it was built as a place for major lectures, musical performances, and theater plays. It was Cardinal Mundelein's notion that formation extended beyond the formal curriculum. So he established a tradition of extracurricular lectures to foster the idea of thinking deeply about critical subjects. Monsignor Hillenbrand, the second rector, introduced the seminarians to the great tradition of the papal encyclicals and to the young liturgical movement. It's fair to say that these two men left an indelible mark on the Chicago Presbyterate and on Mundelein Seminary. This great auditorium then is a place for reaching our minds beyond the classroom. The lecture series begins tonight and continues tomorrow at the, from 9 in the morning until noon. Professor Alvare will deliver her first lecture tonight and the second tomorrow. Faculty responses by Sister Kathleen Mitchell and Father David Olson will follow at 10.30 and the program will conclude at noon. So that's the plan for this lecture series. With those business matters complete, let me now introduce to you the very Reverend John Karchi, Director of Mundelein Seminary. Thanks very much, Father Tom. I just, on behalf of all the faculty and staff here, we want to welcome all our visitors, guests, and friends, uh, both from the parishes uh, and those of you who've traveled quite a bit further than that. The series is named uh, after El Albert Cardinal Meyer the fifth Archbishop of Chicago. Cardinal Meyer was originally ordained a priest of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee in 1926. A graduate of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, he was a significant figure at the Second Vatican Council. He had a firm grasp of both scholarly pursuits and pastoral concerns, and he championed a deeper engagement between the church and the modern world. The Meyer Lecture Series is an endowed lectureship made possible by the generous gift of Father Andrew Greeley, an alumnus of Mundelein from the class of 1954. Father Greeley's original intention was for a strong intellectual engagement of topics and issues modeled after the Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh. The Meyer Lectures, while intended to focus on contemporary issues in theology and the church, would also be interdisciplinary drawing themes not only from theology, but also literature, law, the social sciences, and the arts. The talks are formally published by the University of St. Mary of the Lake, most of them in Chicago studies. We hope eventually to bind them all together uh, in a collected series of published books. In addition to our seminarians here, I want to welcome all the students from our various schools at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, including the pontifical faculty, the Liturgical Institute, and the various ministry formation institutes. I also welcome all our alumni and guests. Please enjoy the program tonight, and if you have the opportunity, whether this evening or tomorrow morning, if you come back, just to walk the grounds, stop in the library, to spend some time on this beautiful campus. So now I'd like to turn the microphone back over to Father Tom Damo, who will introduce this year's Meyer Book. Helen Alvare is professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School, George Mason University, where she teaches family law, law and religion, and property law. She publishes on matters concerning marriage, parenting, non-marital households, and the First Amendment religion clauses. She's faculty advisor to the law school's Civil Rights Law Journal and Latino Latina Law Student Association, a consultant to the Pontifical Council of the Laity in Vatican City, 
and advisor to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, founder of WomenSpeakForThemselves.com, and an ABC News consultant. She cooperates with the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations as a speaker and a delegate to various United Nations conferences concerning women and the family. In addition to her books and her publications in law reviews and other academic journals, Professor Alvarez publishes regularly in news outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and USA Today. She also speaks at academic and professional conferences <coughs> in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and Australia. Prior to joining the faculty of Scalia Law, Professor Alvarez taught at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America, represented the United States Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops before legislative bodies, academic audiences, and the media, and was a litigation attorney for the Philadelphia law firm of Stradley, Roman, Stevens, and Young. Professor Alvare received her law degree from Cornell University School of Law and the master's degree in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America. Please welcome Professor Helen Alvare. to the fact that I'm, I'm old enough to give august lectures at august places with this kind of beautiful architecture and property. Uh, I have to get adjusted and to have my resume read for that long. <laughs> to, to thank Father Bema and to thank the rector so much for having me. It's, it's truly an honor. Mundelein is a big name. I didn't know it was such a big place in addition to being such a big name. And, and to be asked to give a lecture of this, uh, of this um, distinction in history is, is really lovely. And again, I, I really have to get used to the fact that yes, I am old enough to do this. <laughs> um, as you heard from my background, I really have two areas in which I do my scholarship and teaching most. One is the area of the family. And it's very near and dear to my heart. That vocation, if you will, um, was always there, but then came back to me again after working in the pro-life office of the US Bishops Conference because I met so many post-aborted women where really the issue was, after I spoke to say hundreds of these women over my time there, what had gone on in connection with sex, marriage, and parenting that led them to that final place. And I resolved that I would teach family law and go back to that again. Because the area of the family is creating so much, and, and the church's positions on these in particular, is creating so much of a run-in with uh, law in the United States um, and creating free exercise issues. That's really why I began to step into the First Amendment free exercise non-establishment area. So no surprise here, I'll be giving a talk on the family tonight, and I'll be talking about um, religious freedom non-establishment tomorrow. But you'll see there's a family component to, to that as well. So um, I should start by saying that, that as a woman and as a law and religion scholar, I am always overloaded with ideas, uh, sensory and intellectual, just from the world around us today, uh, about uh, sex, marriage, and parenting. And I, I'm really eager to offload some of that onto you and to, to get some of your questions and observations, because I think about this so often that my head is burning and I need some fresh thoughts. I want to know what I'm overlooking or wrongly interpreting, and to, to better serve my service to the academy, the church, and the public. So here's what I want to talk to you about this evening. Here's what's troubling me, troubling a lot of people, actually. There are large and solidifying gaps in the US today between the wealth, income, education, and employment, that is, overall life trajectories, of the wealthy and the poor, which not surprisingly are translating into large and solidifying gaps between the races and between immigrants who've been here for a while and new immigrants. It is remarked upon by scholars coming from pretty much every perspective, right to left, uh, in the areas of family and society. These gaps are importantly formed, and then they're intergenerationally transmitted 
by the mediator of family structure. By which I mean whether or not a person is born into and then reared in a stable two-parent family. Which pretty much, if you want to talk about stable two-parent family, translates into a married uh, biological family. Other family structures, cohabiting, single parenting in particular, sometimes have some indicia of stability, but simply do not, over time, and we've been measuring them for quite a while now, replicate what the marital biological parent um, uh, setup is doing for children. Low percentages of children will likely be with their cohabiting mother and father by age three. Low percentages of children will be with a single mom who hasn't repartnered one or more times after their birth. Renowned Harvard economist Raz Chetty, some of you may have heard of him, he's, a, he's, he's very, very popular right now uh, and, and doing very important work. Uh, he's considered the most reliable economist in the U.S., the most innovative, treating the question of social mobility. He has concluded that at both the individual and the community level, the single most important variable linked with social mobility today is family structure. Another uh, recent article by Professor John Iceland at Penn State concludes that family structure is responsible for at least 33% of the uh, wealth and income gaps between black and white poverty, and is a reason why Hispanic immigrants' economic and educational future in the U.S., the recent immigrants in particular, is simply not looking terribly bright because of family structure. Now, of course, the relationship between poverty and family structure is reciprocal. Non-marital birth causally affects poverty and educational results, which in turn then play important roles bringing about non-marital birth. How does non-marital birth um, cause problems for children? Important sociologists, Andrew Turlin, Brad Wilcox, and I could go on, again, representing a wide uh, political or ideological spectrum, have pointed to a wide variety of factors. Among these, of course, is money, the loss of a second income, which appears to be responsible, according to Sarah McClanahan at Princeton, who's done a lot of research on this, for about 50% of the difference. But then, if you think about it, income and two parents is something that's gonna nest together, so you can't fully pull it apart from the absence of a second parent and say, oh, well, that can be easily fixed because it hasn't been and it doesn't look like it's going to be. There are also other important factors uh, that have causal effects. The loss of the family and social dynamics that stable parenting provides. Basic stuff like time for supervision, guidance, and interaction. The father and mother's support for each other's parenting. Like when I'm standing at the top of a long staircase with postpartum depression with the baby and my husband goes, give it over, sweetie, everything will be fine. There's, there's just the basic things like mutual support for one another. Uh, the practical relief that each person can provide the other. The greater investment that grandparents and other extended family members provide to stably married households, which frankly they don't invest in, in less stable households. They just think that it's not going to be a household that's going to be there for a long time, or the kids aren't married, and they don't put investments into those households. The loss of the early cognitive foundations upon which later attainments build. Cognitive attainments that are built by two super interested parents talking to a child a lot. Words count. The count of words matters. Asking open-ended questions. Speaking with warmth rather than just uh, strictness or cutting the child off. Two parents' network of friends, acquaintances, their network of employers, um, who they enlist on the child's behalf regularly for summer opportunities, after-school opportunities, um, school information, etc. And of course, the different and complementary skills that parents of different sexes, on average, bring to the parenting enterprise. This list helps you understand why it is, upon measurement, that the federal government's extensive programmatic attempts to replicate in unmarried homes what married parents provide has fallen so short of what children require, despite nearly 60 years of trying. You know the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. It's considered the left-leaning think tank. We have American Enterprise Institute or Heritage more on the right. Brookings is considered on the left. 
One of their leading scholars, David Rypar, has succinctly concluded, quote, while interventions that raise incomes, increase parental time availability, provide alternative resources, or provide other in-kind resources would surely benefit children. These are likely to be, at best, only partial substitutes for marriage itself. The advantage of marriage for children appears to be the sum of many, many parts, unquote. And this is after looking at, which I also do in my book of last year, the, um, uh, each and every government program that is provided. University of Chicago economist Susan Mayer, in her book, What Money Can't Buy, talks about the fact that the government does a pretty good job providing the basics, you know, food, shelter, some minimal income, but really hardly at all assist the poor in actually lifting themselves out of poverty or in gaining social mobility. I'm going to comment further today that in some cases, governmental messaging actually um, can be a part of the problem and not part of the solution. Why do I think the government's messaging has been part of the problem? Because if you were really to look at what the government is saying about family structure overall, and I'll get into the details of how they do it, it's really about valorizing adults' choices about sexual expression, about who, what, when, where, and why they would like to have sex with. And this I call the front door of family formation, because children are created at adult sexual encounters. So at the front door, the government is all about valorizing adult sexual choices as freedom. They don't really think about children until they're born and suffering, which is at the back door. Okay? And here I'm referring to all the governmental law and uh, all the governmental branches and to both law and policy. But the matter of sexual expression, whether it's couched in terms of women's rights and it's linked to abortion and contraception, or it's couched in terms of LGBT rights and linked to constitutional rights to non-marital sex or same-sex marriage, these issues are so controversial, these questions of adult sexual expression, that even an approach that asks, hey, what about the children, has very few enthused friends. The ghost of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's 1965 report on the troubles of the black family, which he wrote when he was beginning to see, even at that time, a 25% non-marital birth rate. And he said he thought that this would be very harmful for black prosperity, civility, education, employment, et cetera. He, he, he practically didn't make it out of that, um, that, that book. Uh, actually, it was a Labor Department report alive. Also, the ghost of illegitimacy law, law in the United States that punish children for their parents uh, having them out of wedlock, which law is thankfully gone. But the ghost of that, as well as Daniel Patrick Moynihan's raising it all the way back in 65, haunts any discussion of family structure. But I am used to being in the middle of controversial things, and I also believe that the matter is too significant to be ignored. So I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> uh, it's uh, published last year by Cambridge University. I was very delighted that they would take it up. I thought it was a little bit too controversial for their taste, but they did. This book holds that the matter of children's family structure, which is to say the matter of adult sexual responsibility at the time children are conceived, is important for ethical reasons involving adults' responsibility to the weaker children, whom they make and about whom they now have very clear knowledge what it is they need for flourishing. Family structure is also, we now know, important for reasons that I've introduced of avoiding terrible social divisions between races and groups of immigrants. And it is also important to us as Catholics, who not only embrace the two reasons above because they're reasonable, but we also are concerned because of the immorality of failing to provide very vulnerable human beings what is necessary in the case of the vast majority of them to be what they are, which is gifted givers. This is to say, human beings are gifted givers who require a great deal from their families in order to be capacitated to give the gifts which they have to give, and in order to be capacitated to receive gifts from others. Not only to be able to have a happy and functioning and dignified and free life, but also so as to better understand the identity of God as love, as gift. And also to understand the intrinsic relationality of human life as he has made it, and the meaning and purpose of our own lives as love. 
So in order to treat this huge subject, one little talk, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first remind you and extend a little further of my remarks in the introduction here about what is known about the situation lacking stable family households. Second, I'm going to set out the legal framework that privileges adults' interests over children. And the way I put it, stealing from Don Browning, who taught at the Divinity School at New Chicago, putting adults at the front, front door and children at the back door. Then I'm going to sketch the current inadequacy of the government's posture toward this, uh, as well as come of some of the ethical and anthropological shortcomings, both of the adults' first legal regime and of the government's failed or too late or too little responses. And finally, some modest suggestions for improving the situation. To begin and again extend what I began above regarding the relationship between family structure and child welfare. The literature is really bad, and, and it's good news that scholars from different positions on the ideological spectrum are coming to agreement. They don't have agreement as to what to do about it all, but there's an awful lot of agreement, and that's, that's a blessing, really. There is a consensus that non-marital birth itself often, though not always, yields a variety of negative outcomes for children, which are cognitive, educational, emotional, and economic. Keep in mind throughout my presenting this point what I said uh, from the beginning, and I keep as a fundamental point throughout, that children's family structure is pretty much set at the time of their parents' conception. Now people will say, well, no, people will conceive a child out of wedlock, whether they're dating or cohabiting, and then get married later, so their family structure is not set. But in fact, without going through all the data for purposes of time, I do so in my book, People are not having what we used to call shotgun marriages anymore. People are getting pregnant while unmarried and then not marrying one another and maybe not marrying other people either, but more often than serially dating or cohabiting. Multi-partner fertility is a gigantic phenomenon in the United States. Furthermore, even if people are getting married after they are pregnant, the chances of those marriages lasting are far less. The divorce rates are quite high. And so we actually don't have a very high number of people who created a child out of wedlock who then are rearing a child in a stable, long-term manner inside of a marriage. So for general purposes, a child's long-term family structure is most often, by a long way, created at the time that the child is conceived. I already spoke above about the reciprocal relationship between the deficits that um, non-marital parenting sets up and family structure itself then causing these deficits. Deficits and advantages are also mediated nowadays by something called assortative mating among the advantaged and by marriage deserts among the poor. There's a tremendous amount of literature on this, both qualitative and quantitative. To, to put a, a quick face on it, bosses don't marry their secretaries anymore. Rather, people with education, know-how, and better jobs, um, men and women marry people like themselves. They come from and then create in their households and then have children and then those children create in their households stable marriages with divorce rates among people who have graduated college that look something more like the 1950s. Our divorce rates are not, you know, they're about 42, 45 percent, but they are largely accounted for by people who did not graduate college. People who graduated college have very low divorce rates nowadays. Children who come from this assortative mating setup then tend to do the same. Marry people who are like them, engage in helicopter parenting. I don't know if you've heard the new expression, which is called lawnmower parenting, which isn't, you just don't hover over your kids. You mow the lawn in front of them so that they don't even have to go over any bumps, okay? On the other hand, poorer Americans live in communities already facing astronomical rates of single parenting. There are fewer men in those communities who have what it takes in order for a woman to marry him. They do not have stable employment as likely. They do not have a clean criminal record. They are not as likely to, have, uh, to, to be free from, from drug problems. Um, many of them are incarcerated. When men are scarce in such a marriage market, there is more non-marital sex, more cohabitation. You can see cohabitation ranges with the markets. If women are scarce, there's more marriage. If men are scarce 
and men prefer cohabitation more than women, there's more cohabitation. So in a market with women who would like to have a relationship and who would like to have a child, but a scarce number of men who want to engage in committed relationships, you're going to have a dr dramatically larger amount non-marital sex, multi-partner fertility, and cohabitation. You're also going to have less marriage and dramatically more non-marital children. If you think about it, women's opportunity costs in these communities, that is, the things they're trading off uh, by having a non-marital child, are fairly low. These women do not anticipate that they're actually trading off a great job or, or a great education when they have this child. The child is the gift. The child is the success narrative. The child enables them to be a giver. Lower income plays a role in the causes and consequences of non-marital parenting, as I said before. At the same time, selection affects whether you came from an unstable family background yourself are not the whole story. Single parenting itself has characteristics leading to disadvantages for children, as I described above, a lack of time, a lack of social networks, etc. And marriage, the combined committed efforts of two persons of opposite sexes, itself has characteristics that lead to advantaging children. Finally, a rather new finding is emerging. Again, from the research of, of Raj Shetty, others, David Autor and others are taking it up. It appears that boys reared without their fathers are more likely to underperform economically and educationally than are their sisters. These authors had access to just an amazing data set. I believe it was a million children, all single mothers, and there were brother-sister pairs in every case. If there was a boy, there was also a girl. If there was a girl, there was at least one boy in this household. They were able to measure from prenatal care through you know, birth APGAR scores, through household, uh, environment through kindergarten and school and follow them all the way up into their mid-20s. And what they discovered was the boys fell behind by like ages three to five and never caught up with their sisters. And some are looking at this data and wondering if it's what we're seeing with the tremendous gap uh, that women are surging ahead of males, for instance, in college. Women are surging ahead of males in many areas of employment. Okay. Uh, we don't know what the mechanism is, right? Some are concluding that it's the loss of the role model that a father offers his child. Some are saying it's the presence of a mother who does it all. She, as we used to say in the 70s, whenever that ad was, you know, she brings home the bacon, she puts it in the pan, she dresses nice, she gets everybody ready for school. The mother can do it, and the girl gets very accustomed to the role model of the person who can balance it all. There might also be something related to the way that mothers relate to boys that might be different from the way they, raise, that they relate to girls. We don't know the exact mechanism, but we know what the data looks like. Okay? And we also know that over 85% of single parenting is done by women, and so this is a really important question. Now let me turn to my second point, which is giving you a run-through of uh, American law that involves adult sexual expression over the interests of the well-being of children. The legal framework I'm about to share with you, even assuming that the vast majority of you have no legal background, will still be familiar to you. But you probably haven't thought of these cases in terms of what they say about adult interests relative to children's interests. You've thought of them as, oh, the contraception cases, the abortion cases, etc. So I'm going to propose that the law I will discuss shows how the federal government more and more valorized adult sexual expression, indifferent to marriage, and recklessly indifferent to the well-being of children. I don't dispute that in some cases, maybe many, lawmakers really believed that they were acting with very important noble purposes. The equality and dignity of women, the equality and dignity of LGBT persons, and more generally, the notion of human sexual health as a good, right, that shouldn't be set aside or, or too embarrassed to talk about. All good. But I will be arguing that the state wildly overshot its goals or misaimed and was consistently neglectful of children. Beginning with the judicial branch, I'm going to start in a 1972 Supreme Court decision called Eisenstadt versus Baird. Some of you may be familiar with the 1965 decision, Griswold versus Connecticut. If you're not, I have a two hour C SPAN special on it to bore you. It's funny, great cases of history. And me and another law professor talked just about Griswold for two hours. Um, so Griswold, in 1965, 
was like the end of state laws that banned contraception. They banned them because they believed that it would get into the hands of single people, that it would lead married people toward adultery, that it would make the whole notion of bearing children sort of too light and unimportant. So Griswold in 1965 holds that married people have a right. It's not in the text of the Constitution, but it is so deeply a part of the history and tradition of the country, the privacy of the marital bedroom, the privacy of the marital partnership, that the court is going to announce that there is a non-textual but fundamental constitutional right to uh, privacy in the marital bedroom and in the marriage, broad enough to encompass the use of contraception. So that state laws banning it are not only you know, not good, but they're unconstitutional. Okay, they are a violation of the federal constitution. So what's important about the 1972 case of Eisenstadt versus Baird is there the court took the right of contraception found in Griswold and then extended that right to the unmarried. In Eisenstadt, the court declared that whereas the right of marital use was grounded in the privacy of the marital relationship and bedroom, the right for single persons was grounded in the right of the individual quote, to make decisions so fundamental, unquote, as those respecting whether or not to bear or beget a child. They say in that case, marriage is not really a unity. It's two individual people with minds and hearts of their own, and the woman has her own mind and heart and gets to make decisions so fundamental. In short, the court announced a constitutional right of privacy moving away from marriage and into the heads of individual. Excuse me. Is there water in the No. Okay. I, don't, I might be able to use it sometime. That would be great. So um, that's really important because now anything that's considered a super important decision, I'll just come over and go. Anything that's a super important decision might be a constitutional right. Hmm. What about polygamy? What about right to die? What about all these super important decisions? Uh, turns out that the only time the court has really extended this right of privacy to quote matters so fundamental ends up being about adult sexual expression. They actually didn't mean what they said, but they had to come up with some language in order to permit what was at issue in this case. Nothing was said in this case about the rights or well-being of children. Nothing at all, okay? Then, of course, right after Eisenstadt, we have Roe versus Wade, which came a year after Eisenstadt. There, the decision was replete with language, problematizing children as a heartache for women, especially women who were unmarried or unhappy about being pregnant. Nothing was said about the well-being of the child whose abortion, even in the third trimester, is guaranteed by Roe and the companion case Doe requirement that states allow abortions for health reasons in the third trimester, health to include, and I'm quoting, all factors, physical, psychological, emotional, familial, or the age of the woman relevant to the well-being of the patient, unquote. Okay, so it's all abortion. So nothing about the well-being of the child. Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992 is the next big case in abortion. It states that sex, and decisions about childbearing structured around the legal availability of contraception and abortion are constitutionally protected 14th Amendment liberties. Why? Because liberty protect, protects adult decisions about shaping their own identity and forming their own universe. Really? Okay. Clearly, I mean, don't even ask how many opinions Justice Scalia had fun with that. That was a Justice Kennedy poem. Um, and, I mean, really, what if shaping my own universe involves child abuse? You know, what if it involves sedition, treason? What, what if any of these things? But it's clearly language crafted in order to put a, a 21st century philosophical viewpoint covering over this right to abortion. The court talked about the necessity for women to have, quote, unplanned activity, their euphemism for sex, free of the problem of children as essential to their forming their identity and their universe. In 2003, the court finally states clearly what all of the above decisions really implied, that the right to sex, completely unlinked to children and marriage, is a constitutional right. 
They talk about contraception. They talk about abortion. Now, finally, in 2003, Lawrence versus Texas, which involved a Texas statute banning homosexual sodomy, the court finally gets around to saying sex completely unrelated to children and, and orthogonal, completely on a different plane than marriage in 2003, um, is a constitutional right. The court, of course, relied on the Casey decision to the effect that decisions about having uh, homosexual sex are protected because they shape the identities and universe of the parties involved. Finally, in 2015, the court issues what's known as the same-sex marriage opinion in Obergefell versus Hodges. If you think for even a moment about what the court was saying about marriage and children there, you'll think of this decision in the future as about much more than the same-sex marriage opinion. It is rather a devastating commentary by the law about the value of children in the eyes of the law. For in Obergefell, the court's essential holding was the following. There is nothing rationally special about the procreation of children or linking those children with the parents who made them so that they can know their parents and the parents can know them, such that the state is even allowed to provide a special institution for romantically involved couples who can procreate and then know and be known by their children. Rather, Obergefell holds, as a matter of federal constitutional law, that procreation and the incentivizing of homes in which children and parents can know one another must be regarded by every single state as no different and no more desirable than the complete impossibility of procreation and the encouraging of households in which, in every single case, every child will be separated from his or her mother or father or both. That's really to think of Obergefell in terms of Adults at the front door, children at the way back door, but hardly ever mentioned. The only children mentioned in the Obergefell opinion were children already living in same-sex married households, which for very confusing reasons doesn't even really get at children being, quote, raised by same-sex parents since the vast majority of those children were, were conceived by one of the parents in that household with a prior heterosexual relationship. So those children actually had a mother and father somewhere else. So to speak of them as the only children the court was concerned about is very odd and doesn't really indicate that the court addressed the question of the value of children or children knowing their parents at all. It's not on, only the judicial branch that has acted to facilitate adult sexual expression indifferent to children in marriage, but the executive branch also actively pursued this path, albeit depending upon which executive is in office, okay? I'll talk a little bit later about how when it comes to the question of contraception, it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or Democrat. They're, they're really all for contracepting the poor. But when it came in particular to sort of encouraging adult sexual expression and, um, and experimentation, some of my most prominent examples come from the Obama administration, which while it discouraged teen pregnancies, openly encouraged unmarried women 20 or over on its websites and in its publicly available literature to consult only their own wishes <laughs> regarding whether or not to have a child as a single parent. The administration partnered with Planned Parenthood Federation of America and um, a group that used to be called National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancies. I like to think that it was me and some other people who figured out that that acronym was knocked up so that they now call themselves Power to Decide. Okay? So they're no longer NCTP, NCPTUP, they are Power to Decide. Anyway, the Obama administration relied on this group for information and advice that they promoted through their websites to women 20 and over regarding um, uh, uh, choosing to have children. Some of that advice included sex tips for single women to heat up your weekend, advice to have a child with whomever and whenever you wanted, so long as it makes you happy, and providing pornographic postcards to send to your partner. In short, when it comes to federal policy concerning the well-being of children in connection with family structure, it is easy to say that at the front door of family formation, it's about the adults all the time. Now, I'd be surprised if one of more of you didn't immediately respond by saying, isn't federal contraception policy at least their attempt to be highly attentive to children's well-being at the front door? Aren't they attempting to prevent the birth of children into difficult circumstances, particularly non-marital births? 
isn't about $2.3 billion that gets spent every year in handling contraception to the poor in America. Um, in effect, the government statement that it's a social good to have children when you have a more stable family structure to have them. Well, not really. It's true that when it comes to teens, the state offers contraception every once in a while alongside specific references that teens children will face difficulties if they have very young and single parents. But regarding Americans 20 or over, however, as I described above, the judicial, the legislative, and executive branch has been messaging, it's your choice. Furthermore, we have to look at what the state contraception programs say they are trying to achieve and how they have operated nearly these past 50 years. They don't say that they are assisted, that they are attempting to assist children to have stable family structures. They do say that they are all about putting the power to decide in the hands of women. Their, their entire measurement of success is, did you intend this baby or not? It's all about, in other words, the phrase you hear, unintended pregnancies. And if you look at all the federal and state contraception materials, it's all about, well, do you want the baby? Well, you know, we're not even talking to you about family structures, just did you intend it? Ironically, even according to this measure, and even if their leaders assume that avoiding unintended pregnancies would mean avoiding more fragile family structure for children, they have been so wrong, and so wrong for so long, that they are now no longer entitled to our goodwill and the benefit of the doubt. To wit, the very audiences that have been fed free federal contraception since 1970 at least, are the very audiences experiencing the highest rates of unintended pregnancies and very high rates of non-marital births. Far, far higher rates than when these contraception programs first began in 1970. Our entire country is presently experiencing a non-marital birth rate of 40%. That is four out of every 10 children. But that rate moved from 5% right before 1970, when these contraception programs began, to 33% in the 90s to its current figure. And among the poor and minority, these figures are even more dramatic. Among those without a high school education, non-marital births top 70% of all births. Among those without a college education, they are over 50%. For African Americans, the figure is about 72% and for Hispanic Americans, about 54%. A good deal of economic research, in particular the research by quite famous Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen and her husband, a Nobel Prize winning economist, George Akerlof, and a very recent paper last month uh, by other scientists in the journal Economic Inquiry, show quite pronounced relationships between the rise of the availability of contraception and higher rates of non-marital sexual activity rates that these authors believe have a causal element. <laughs> in other words, if contraception, which by the way overall has about an 8% failure rate, that's 8 out of 100 you know, uses, that's, that's pretty high, an 8% failure rate, were used by already sexually active persons, we would expect to see non-marital birth rates decline. But there is very good evidence that its promotion and easy availability by the government drew into sexual activity women who would not otherwise have been sexually active. This is the phenomenon of risk compensation, well known in the economic literature. People will take risks to do things that they believe are insured. So people who hadn't previously been involved in something risky think, well, now that it's insured, I can try it. Furthermore, because it's described above, for poorer women, there are fewer marriageable men in their marriage markets. <clears throat> they may have a particular desire to be a gifted environment a gifted giver in an environment with very few opportunities to be that. There is also a more evident among the poor, and remember, this is the very place the government is promoting its contraceptive programs to a very dramatic degree, okay? There's more evident among the poor a demand between uh, sexually involved couples that the woman demonstrate trust in developing a sexual relationship, which insists that she and the man avoid contraception, in particular condoms. It is also the case, as I said before, that the opportunity costs in those communities of having a child are not that high. Thus, it is no surprise that poor women and children experience single parenting at dramatically higher rates than their wealthier sisters. And because single parenting 
and the larger number of premarital sexual partners and um, non-marital cohabitation are all causally as well as correlated associated with more fragile marital bonds. It's also not surprising that we would see not only less marriage and more cohabitation, but more divorce among the poor and minority in the United States. Having addressed the idea that the government's supposed attention to the front door of family formation, that is, adult sexual encounters and the government's contraception programs, is not really child protective, and in fact may actually decapacitate adults for building long-term stable relationships, by accustoming them to divorcing the idea of sex from children, of sex even from tomorrow. Let me turn a little bit of my attention now to the government's backdoor attempts to help children. Here, I won't bore you. If you want to be bored, read like chapter four in my book. The federal government has literally dozens of programs largely devoted to attempting to ameliorate the common um, uh, child-rearing deficits found in, in non-marital households. In the book, I review every one of these programs, every one of their program goals, every one of their annual budgets. And I look, because I wrote it right at the end of the Obama administration, or like I came out like a year after that had turned over, um, I look at the Obama administration's evaluations of the programs, presuming that they would want these programs to succeed in a particular way. There is everything from prenatal stuff to stuff the minute the child is born, to, to nurse family partnership, to preschool, uh, early Head Start, Head Start, after school programs, programs to assist children in tutoring after school, summer programs, job programs, um, every child every day programs to get children to school, my brother's keeper programs to, um, to mentor younger men without a father at home, and I could go on, okay? Um, if you look at the outcomes of all these programs, you can say at the end of the day that the Nurse Family Partnership Program has some pretty good data, and the social mobility, it's called the Moving to Opportunity Program, where they take children out of neighborhoods. They've been doing this for a while, and they have some good data on it. The single largest predictor of a child struggling in a neighborhood is a neighborhood with a very large percentage of families with no fathers in them. And they take those children to neighborhoods with, with more stable, the earlier the better, with more stable family um, uh, situations in the household. And they actually have some good data about the trajectory of those children. But aside from those two programs, there's really not much out of all of those other programs, okay? Even Early Head Start and Head Start, which are such favorites. Uh, in the words of Brookings sociologist Isabel Saho, again, firmly on the left in this area, she says, for every child that you pull out of poverty with a social program, you're going to find another child falling into poverty because of the breakdown of the family. So aside from the obvious fact that children aren't flourishing under our current regime, and contraception and backdoor programs aren't working, what else might we say in evaluating this? You can go on at quite a length making both ethical and anthropological critiques, but I'll just offer a few here. The first is to say, of course, that we must alter course. We are ethically obliged to do so, and even more so as Catholics. Children are perhaps, as Hans Jonas, the environmental philosopher, wrote, the most obvious example of an is that turns into an ought. We make them. We make their family structure. We know the, the, the effects of family structure. They arrive incredibly vulnerable and in need of our care for an extensive time. What we do for them at the very, very beginning has outsized effects. I think James Heckman might be another U Chicago guy, a Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote, later attainments build on foundations that are laid down early. Early family environments are major predictors of cognitive and non-cognitive abilities. Disadvantage um, uh, uh, causes a child to fall behind who may never catch up. There's something some of you may have heard about. It was a famous book by um, these Professor Hart and Risley, um, the 30 million word gap is the famous sort of summary of it, that one of the advantages of a stable marital home is that a combination of two parents with more time to just talk with the child. And there's a little less stress, they're not running so much, they can cover for each other, they can support one another's parenting, and for other reasons, there is less stress, higher uh, conversation with children, more open-ended questions, more warmth and less just direction, do this, do that, 
and just a, a higher volume of words. And they estimate that by the time children have hit school, there's a 30 to 50 million word gap. And the brain develops in reaction to quantity of words as well as to warmth and a requirement for the brain to go and imagine things and come up with connecting, uh, you know, connecting one part of the brain to another because an interesting question has been asked. If you wanted the government to replicate that, they would have to send someone into your house to speak to the child for over 30 hours a week. This is the kind of thing that David Rybar is talking about when he says there are just things that happen in a home that a government cannot put together. Uh, we also know that current contraception and backdoor solutions are not working. And as I said before, I think there's evidence that they are decapacitating people for long-term unified parental care. Think about it. Whether it's the federal government or the feds partnering with Planned Parenthood and the newly named Power to Decide, the message they're sending them is go ahead completely dissociate sex from even the idea that whatever you think it is, nature, God, has made sex the place that creates new life, who is linked to you in a unique way and creates family, kin, future. Absolutely set that aside. Think about that. If you tell people that long enough and you facilitate that, think about how difficult it is to demand of those same adults, which we do, that the minute that child is conceived or born, they have to turn on a dime and devote decades of care and sacrifice precisely to that person they hadn't been thinking about or thinking about in relationship to the sexual partner or the sexual partner's family or their own family at all for moments before that. I would add that the idea remains powerful in the United States, that we have to put up with all of these economic and social and ethical problems. Because to do otherwise would be to offend adult sense of a right to privacy and sexual choice in their family lives. We are also afraid, and I think this is a bigger and more important concern, to, to put off, to offend, to be cruel to women who more often lead single parent households than men or offend their children. But we have to find a way to thank them for what they are doing, but also to point out that we have to do better by children. Today, I think the burden of proof is on those who would suggest that adult interests still should outweigh the interests of children and outweigh the interests of society in avoiding permanent and growing gaps that are, again, largely due to family structure between rich and poor, black and white, former immigrant and recent immigrant. I think the burden of proof is on the other foot now. The changes I'm proposing are quite incremental, actually. I mean, there's, this is huge, right? And you can't push society, lurch them in a new direction quickly. I always like to say first that the first move should be to stop stupid in law and policy. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, we can no longer actually continue to promote adult sexual expression recklessly indifferent to marriage and the well-being of the children they make. Any suggestion that adults have rights relating to sexual expression that are wholly separate from the well-being of children needs to be jettisoned. So for example, federal government language of the kind I described before, laws purporting to specially protect cohabitants' rights to live in housing, even as against, for instance, religious landlords, um, governmentally sponsored messages suggesting that non-marital childbearing plans are simply a matter of your own whim. All of this is out under the heading of Stop Stupid. I'm not advocating for a return to the sticks of the past, laws criminalizing adultery, fornication, cohabitation, or the laws that were called illegitimacy that punish children for what their parents did by bringing them into the world without marriage. These are, in the case of the illegitimacy laws in particular, cruelly unfair. They are also, as a whole, impossible to enforce all of these, adultery, fornication, cohabitation bans, impossible to enforce fairly. Usually local law enforcement will go in on some select criteria that are not fair. They involve other violations of ordinary privacy expectations and are galactically removed from our current social will. At the same time, I'd like to see a public campaign calling adults to their responsibilities for children's family structure. I'd like to see that campaign use the ringing and emotional tones of the civil rights movement. Why shouldn't every American 
no matter how recent, no matter the color of their skin, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much education they have, have our assistance in a stable family life. I would like to see a continuation of government programs designed to help with all the things people need to, lead, to, to live a stable and dignified life, obviously. There is, and we have this uh, a lot in Catholic tradition, talking about subsidiarity, but also the government's need to assist families as a major social building block. So government programs regarding employment, education, in particular, I'd like to see a lot more job-sensitive vocational or apprenticeship education or affordable education. And of course, income programs, in particular, a living wage. I would like to see these programs explicitly linked to the part they might play in promoting stable marriage and child rearing. I would recommend that sex ed become relationship ed. There's a great deal of evidence that neither comprehensive sex ed nor sexual risk avoidance slash abstinence education is really taking on these big questions, okay? Regarding contraception, I am under no illusion that both Republicans and Democrats would like to deliver a maximum amount of contraception to the poor, okay? On the other hand, I would love the government, wherever, quote, sex is spoken, to acknowledge that sex without commitment portends harm not only for children, but also for the unity of the parents. I've heard people say this about the church's teaching too. All along with the money vitae and contraception, we were talking so much about the falling away of the procreative aspect of sex, and now we know that the unity went right with it, right? That it is, it, it just, it, it's a real damage to people to divorce sex from tomorrow, in a unity way as well. I would like this encapsulated in some sort of a warning when the government speaks about contraception. Similar to what Berkeley, California is thinking of sticking on its gas pumps and you're about to put some in your car, right? Uh, or what the government has put on cigarettes regarding smoking, okay? I'd like to have a warning that said, looks like something like this. Sex is important, not only because it makes an important connection between the adults involved, but also because it makes babies. The moment of conception is also the moment that a child's family structure is formed. Family structure matters. Parents create their children's family structure when they have sex. And a stable, healthy marriage is the best place for children. If you get in the habit of distancing yourself emotionally and mentally from sexual partners and the children you can easily create, it could be harder for you to form a strong marriage or for you and your spouse to become dedicated parents. In addition to health effects on women, it's possible that contraception and widespread reliance on it increases the pressure on women to participate in sex they don't really want and has led to an increase in non-marital birth. I like it. I could shorten it if they wanted to sit on a pack of whatever. <laughs> in conclusion, to those who believe that my argument is nostalgic, I would respond that there's nothing nostalgic about an argument based on what we know now from the most current empirical evidence. There's nothing nostalgic about an ethic and an outcome that corresponds to what we know not only women, but also men currently prefer in connection with their sexual expression. That is, sex associated with commitment and an eye to tomorrow. And there's nothing nostalgic about an argument which could boost the civil rights of poorer minority and more recent immigrant Americans so that they might also enjoy the blessings and benefits that today only privileged Americans are thoroughly enjoying. Thank you very much. in the program, Professor Al Ray is uh, willing to entertain questions. Now, because the program is being live streamed, that means there's another audience that we can't see here. Uh, but what's most important is that they can hear what's going on. So uh, Monica is over here with a microphone. And uh, so um, if you would like to pose a question, Professor Al Ray, wave and uh, Monica will come to you. But don't speak without the microphone. So that's just both for everyone here uh, in the uh, auditorium, but also our, our friends and uh, participants who are uh, off through uh, cyberspace that way. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, it's very hard for us to see you. 
So we're going to depend on Monica to get the question going, and then Professor Alvarez will uh, answer from there. And I'll repeat the question if other people can't hear it. So. Professor Alvarez, thank you for your presentation. You were, you were very generous in providing the thoughts of those on the left or the progressive wing or liberal wing. And they often, in your presentation, they, they ascertained the facts of what was right in front of them. But what is their suggestion about a direction to take? I mean, I, I sort of understand what we would say on the, on the conservative side or on the, the right side of the spectrum. But with presented with the same data and understanding that there is a problem, what does the left say is a solution? Okay. Thanks so much. So I don't regard either myself or my book as left or right. And I, um, I use almost exclusively sources in the book, hundreds of them, either distinctly on the left or just widely acclaimed economic, sociological sources. Um, so there's two things to say. One is, the good news is, there's a lot of agreement between people who are self-identified, liberals and conservatives, on this. That, um, and Isabel Sawhill at Brookings is, is commendably one of the, the more prominent voices on this, saying, no, it's not all just about putting enough money into a household to get the same outcomes. Now, th there are actual things that happen in the household, and I tried to describe those for you, that contribute to a child's well-being. The other thing is, it is simply not going to happen in the United States that we're going to dump $50,000 into each household or whatever it would take. We also know that even in countries like Sweden that have brought non-marital and marital households to within a very close percentage uh, income of one another, that you see the same things, which is a very interesting phenomenon leading to it being about the, 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 the anthropology of sex, marriage, and parenting, and the, and the dynamics of households versus just money. So uh, with regard to causal effects, there's agreement. With regard to maintaining um, uh, the government programs that provide this base level of some income and decent housing and food and access to education, there's good agreement. There's also good agreement that we are really far behind on like apprenticeships and vocational education. That we are so lagging behind what the labor market could benefit from and from what, what now working poor or very poor could benefit from. There's a, there's, so there's nice agreement on that. There's, there's some nice agreement on the earned income tax credit and, and other tax proposals. However, uh, I, I debated uh, this topic at Columbia Law School, and I thought, uh, just a few weeks ago, and I thought, okay, I'm really going to hear, because it was a very brief debate, the, the sort of the classic and cleanest rejoinder from someone who is self-identified on the left on this, and the answer was, no, we simply have to find a way to put more money into the households people choose. That we, we like billions more a year, that we simply have to account for it that way, not acknowledging that empirically that doesn't look like a likely uh, result. And the other is more and better contraception. That if we could just teach people to use it better, or if we could persuade, especially poor women, to use longer acting kinds. So this is a, you have no idea how many books on my shelves at home have embarrassed my children by even being there on this topic. <laughs> and the, the joke in my house is, it's from Amazon. It says sex. Put it in mom's pile. You know, it's sort of like <laughs> to say they desensitize. Um, hopefully we've had cheerful conversations on this topic. But anyway, so here's the situation. It is very clear that despite the rhetoric of women's empowerment, the federal government got into contraception as a way of um, the poor not having more children. And, and, and initially, very much so, oh, well, they won't be able to take care of them. Well, the fact is, it was really always also, and maybe more so, that the public fisc was, uh, the public fisc was, um, was uh, going to be involved, okay? So the, um, 
the question about whether contraception was ever going to be a woman's rights thing is really not actually the case. It's been rebranded, but it's not true. If you look at some of the Obama administration stuff on Medicaid, I just want to point this out in particular. I found it particularly disturbing. A couple things. The only thing that a woman can really get 100% reimbursal on in the United States is contraception. It's the only medical thing. Everything else is 50%, 70%. The only thing where she has complete freedom of provider, any doctor she goes to will be paid 100% by the feds if she's poor, is contraception. The other thing that's very interesting is when the Obama administration wanted poor women to use more IUDs. So IUDs implanted, they last three to ten years. You have to have a doctor to put them in. You have to have a doctor to take them out. The Obama administration put out, very quietly, no fanfare, this Medicaid guidance that said to doctors treating poor women who had given birth, unlike all other medicines you can think of or drugs and devices in the history of medicine, we're going to pre-stock your delivery room with free IUDs. And the minute that child is delivered, we want you to have the IUD essentially in the other hand and to say, you know, I could insert this right now if you want, and that way you wouldn't have to have any more children. You have to really dig deep. These are only a couple-year-old sort of guidance from Health and Human Services Medicaid division. Richard Nixon's National Security Memorandum 2000, just to sort of give an example on the Republican side, basically wanting to contracept the third world into a smaller size so that they couldn't have social chaos, be disruptive, and interrupt our delivery of basic resources that we were using from those countries. What's happened, though, is contraception has become instead sort of a rallying cry for sexual freedom, meaning sex without marriage, sex without children. It's been closely associated now by Planned Parenthood. It is the symbol. Abortion and contraception are the symbol of all that is good for women. You know, it has taken up all the oxygen in the room about what women really want. And that's what I get usually. That's the most prominent. Either no, I'm ignoring the family structure studies that marriage matters, or if we could just get them to use this long-acting contraception. I mean, Isabel Sawhill at Brookings would sort of like to have it in young girls from like ages 13 to 29 and said if we could just put the baby off until later. The reaction of the poor communities is you are trying to contracept us into smaller sizes. This is racial. This is ethnic. This is socioeconomic. And you're scaring us. And so there's a lot of articles in the leading contraception magazines about efforts to promote long-acting among the poor where poor people are saying back, I don't trust you. You remember there was a big scandal in the 90s when they promoted Norplant, which is to plant five tubes of hormonal contraception under the arms of a woman. And they just offered you cash in cities like Baltimore with super high non-marital pregnancy rates. And then they offered you gift cards later. There were two experiments, one in St. Louis, one in Colorado, where they got poor and minority girls who had had an abortion and were like, here's gift cards and we're going to call your house seven times and you need to use longer acting. It will really be great. So even interesting when Brookings and American Enterprise Institute, when the left and the right got together and issued this really nice report on poverty, opportunity, responsibility in the U.S., they agreed easily on the role that family structure plays in poverty, but they couldn't agree and they stated outright, Brookings wants long-acting contraception among the poor and working poor for decades. And American Enterprise Institute said this makes us nervous. This seems a little genocidal or something. That's not the word they used. I shouldn't say that. This seems a little racial and ethnic animus and we're worried. So that's the usual response I get, that technology will cure it. There was one back there. I have a question. I have a question. Dr. Elliot, I'm Josh Miller from the Diocese of Fairbanks, Alaska and the Archdiocese of the Military Services. From your viewpoint at the national level of the research data, can you speak or comment to any relationships between your work 
and the legal aspects of uh, gender ideology, pornography, or human sex trafficking, and how they affect or are affected by uh, what's going on with the family structure. Yeah. So this is all the question. <laughs> The question of uh, sort of sexual expression, exposure to sexual images or ideas, um, and sex trafficking, there's no question that the separation of sex, it's, it's, it's something you might the unbearable lightness of sex, right? I mean, read Zygmunt Bauman, Liquid Modernity, right? Or you know, liquid relationships. Um, Anthony Giddens talked about it, not, you know, a conservative by just a very eminent sociologist uh, from Cambridge University. Um, I want to say Pyotr, I forget his last name, maybe Sorokin, he was the founder, he's a Russian Orthodox guy and the founder of sociology department at Harvard University. Um, Zygmunt Bauman talks about it. Even if you said God aside, if in your human, you know, horizon, you separate the idea that a sexual encounter has any aspect that is beyond the moment, any aspect that is about another person, that is about another day, tomorrow, that has a meaning beyond itself, then it becomes a transaction. Uh, I, I write a lot about this in the book, uh, that I write, when I, I do an interplay between the law and philosophical currents, and I talk about liquid sexuality. And it's simply the case that it would be far more, that one of these ideas would lead to another. For instance, I was on a panel at Yale Law School, and um, a, a man who was, uh, previously uh, wrote about gay law at UCLA, now he's a prominent family law professor at Yale uh, Law School. He said, you know, we got gay marriage, because of Eisenstadt and Griswold and Rowe. He said it was straight people separating sex from marriage and children that made it legally possible to say, this is how it is. This is, this is freedom. And gay marriage was just sort of a footnote to that at the end, right? So in the same way, if the well-being of the partner, if the, the physicality, the physical structure of the partner, if the act itself has no relationship to any other person, any other time, or any transcendent good, then these matters of your sexual identity, or the expression that you do, or, or watching it uh, in any form, as long as it's, or trafficking. Now, trafficking is the one that almost everybody will speak against, because it's not consensual. It, the demand for sex, that these other things raise certainly fuels trafficking. But, the, but, but it's now only consent. It is not any other good of any kind in the human horizon or beyond, including any other person or any other time that comes into play when evaluating any sexual act at all. And so, you know, that's just one led to another, and now they're each fueling the other. It's a circle. Right in the middle, toward the back there. I'm afraid of that microphone. <laughs> Dr. Oliver, thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight. I wanted to ask you, I'm uh, Tim Berryhill, PR Science in Chicago. I wanted to ask you about the overlap of U.S. policy uh, and how and its effects on the fertility rate. Uh, just last year, uh, the United States went from 1.8 births uh, per woman to 1.76. And that can have a disastrous uh, effect on our culture at large. And I was wondering, you mentioned a lot of these state and federal policies that are geared towards the poor. Um, my presumption is probably yes, but uh, do they have any overlap, any overarching kind of influence with um, the national culture concerning sexual ethics and births yeah. at large? The question of fertility, I, I try to stay away when I am writing from, so you see this, you know, the the sort of finger wagging at countries who can't get their birth rates up to a certain rate. And it's all true. All the economics that is written about the 
difficult futures of countries with declining birth rates. It's true. Um, I, I just find that it's, it's, a, it's sometimes that it, uh, that writing has the, you know, I told you so, you were bad, and now you're going to suffer, and your economies are going to collapse thing. That said, I'd like to talk rather about the fact that people uh, are actually not even having the number of children they prefer. Uh, an article came out you know, with, a, with a pretty reliable national survey last year that said, so the average American woman would like to have like three kids. Who knew? <laughs> right? Um, but they don't feel that they can. They feel that life is not structured and that there is, the structures are so rigid the time for high school, the time for college, the necessity for more and more jobs that pay for even some graduate degree, hours of work, women uh, all uh, and men working according to sort of a notion of the ideal male worker that came out of the you know from the fifties onward. Um, the the idea that our national economy and the economics of corporations quarter by quarter, and that we always have to be growing. And that our pride as Americans is the size and dominance of our economy. My husband always says the United States is, a con is an economy with a culture loosely attached. And not even close to the other way around. And I, I really do think he has quite a point there. That the entire culture is not conducive to having, to spending time with, to prioritizing, to being able to afford and manage a life with children. And um, interestingly, I think it's, it's happening now, and I, I saw this data, but I didn't bring it with me, that you now are in a situation where uh, women with education are somewhat out marrying women with less education. It used to be what they called sort of the blue stocking phenomenon, right? Women with advanced degrees didn't get married. Nobody wanted to marry them. Now they are getting married more often. And they are actually, um, women with education are starting to have more kids. So again, it's become like a privilege that goes with money instead of one of the great gifts of life that, that, that goes completely free of limits on race and money and education, etc. cetera. Um, we are not a communitarian, a family-oriented culture at all unless you're lucky enough to have one, I mean, as a whole, I wrote a, a very big law review article, I think it's on SSRN, a copy of it, called um, Curbing Its Enthusiasm, The Federal Government and the Unitary Family. They don't, we don't have a national family policy. You know, now, we don't want to turn into, you know, what Russia and Denmark and Japan are doing. Denmark has an ad campaign, and I'm sure you haven't seen it, it's called Do It for Denmark. And if you go away and you go on a vacation and you conceive, they'll retroactively pay for it. Russia, and you can imagine that Vladimir Putin does this with a particularly delicate touch, um, actually announces that he wants people to just go home from work and do it. Have babies for Mother Russia. Um, Hungary is a little bit more... Um, uh, cheerful on the topic and, and, and being um, pretty religious uh, uh, tone to what they're doing. Um, it's just offering you gobs of money to have children. Japan is offering a lot of money, but people are saying even then it's not enough because it's so hard to afford children. Um, you might call that a family policy. We certainly don't have that. Although if we were going to have it, I guess Donald Trump is a man to articulate it. Um, <laughs> no, he's, going to, he's going to have a hard time doing better than do it for Denmark. Um, but we don't actually think in our tax policy, our labor policy, our employment policy, our education policy, our parental leave policy, our, our wage policy. How would families survive on that? How are people going to get married? How are they going to take care of children? How are they going to take care of their disabled and el elderly relatives? Are they really going to be able, are we going to have that kind of flex in a family economy and life that they could do that? We don't have that policy. Think about the kinds of things you would need. You'd need a living wage. You'd need a housing policy. You'd need um, education 
to ensure, I mean, you know, <laughs> the fact is women will not marry a man without a stable employment in most cases. I know that sounds very sexist, and people say, oh, it's so anti-feminist. I'm just looking at the data, okay? They want to marry a man with a stable income. We need to have policies that make sure that both men and women can find it. So marriage really isn't going to, to thrive. The top of the cake, but rather something you build together. Um, now, the idea of marriage is capstone or soulmate. It's the big talk in sociology. People wait until they have everything all together. I got my job, I've got my education, I've got more or less stable money. I think I know where I want to live. Okay, I'm ready. As distinguished from, we're building something together. And we start with not a lot, we build it together. Um, it's not about two people who are finished products living together in what University of Pennsylvania economists said marriage was turning into hedonic exchange. Two people who enjoy the same things, enjoying them more in each other's company. It's not that. It's not, oh, you're complete, and now you can enjoy the things that you each like in each other's company, but rather building something together as a unit. That is a cultural task that, frankly, it has to be intellectual. It also has to be religious. Right? It's, it's something that we have the wherewithal to do. We have a fantastic theology that has, as Don Browning says, is also a carrier of practical rationality. It carries Aristotle. It carries, it carries the empirics that we know about evolution and about, uh, about genetics and about the vulnerable needs of the child. And it, and it keeps going back and forth between what we know between revelation and reason to build up a really fabulous body of teachings on what the family should require. Um, so there's more than policy involved, family policy, to actually have people, to have children and to rear them um, happily in, in a family that has some flexibility um, financially and full of time. Um, but it's also gonna take a cultural shift in addition to these other policy areas. Thank you, Professor. So eight or nine years ago, eight or nine years ago, there was a young man who testified in front of a committee of Congress. He was an Eagle Scout, and he was testifying on how his, uh, he had two women as his parents. It was a same-sex couple. And he was talking about how his development with a same-sex couple had not been any different than anyone else. And so I'm curious, do you have any information, statistics yeah. on economic development with same-sex couples, men or women, and how that has, from an economic perspective, affected the development of their kids. Interesting. So, we know that same-sex couples, um, the men in particular, are, are generally much wealthier than, um, than opposite-sex couples on average. What, uh, what we don't know is the dynamics of the household so well. So this is highly controverted, and I'll give you a very brief run through. You may know that all the studies that claim to show that there were no differences, that there have been meta-analyses of these studies, and they really all have fatal scientific analytical problems. They mostly relied on, uh, they were all selection effects. They relied on snowball samples. They didn't do nationally representative samples. They put up a, a note on a library bulletin board that said any same-sex couples come on and tell us how your kids are doing. So the parents were reporting about the children. It was usually over a very short time period. The children were not reporting about themselves. We had no idea how long those children had been in the households, and we didn't really have any way of verifying whether what they said was true. So those are sort of the usual problems with the studies. The first nationally representative study comes out a few years ago, led by a sociologist named Mark Regnerus at the University of Texas. And he looks at an actual nationally representative sample. He looks at actual empirical markers of how the children are doing, not parents' reports of the children, and not even the children themselves, but actual men. Did they graduate from school? Did they report have psychological or problems? What were their health situations? How did they report uh, at different ages, you know, just their level of happiness? How was their employment, et cetera? and discovers that children viewed for uh, a long time in same-sex households had um, a great deal more problems on, on, on a great number of 
of markers. Okay. Now, Margaret Maris was, to say savage doesn't even begin. You know, his life was threatened, his job was threatened, his family was threatened. You cannot mention his name in polite society uh, in the academy without being told that, you know, you're just too stupid to, to live. I mean, he's, to say he has suffered for this study doesn't even begin. Um, the problem was that it was scientifically valid, <laughs> and um, they tried the best response to it, which I think is a valid response, but it's not so much a critique as a problem with doing these studies in the first place. Anyway, a leading sociological journal published it. They refused to retract it. They said it was good science. All the, the people who said it wasn't, they said, I'm sorry, your argument isn't that good. Um, what the difficulty is, is that it's still the case that most children who are reared with two parents of the same sex were born into a heterosexual couple, including one of those two people. Okay? That, at the time of the Obergefell decision, um, that was about 85% of kids being reared in same-sex households. The others were adoption and reproductive technology. So that's one thing. So what was, what was indefinitely endogenous, mixed in, and what Mark ended up measuring was that these children had been suffering family instability. And we know that instability is probably the, the, the vehicle by which family structure affects children's well-being. So it explains to you why, for instance, while the married biological two-parent household is the gold standard, that the single mother who never repartners is the next one. Why? Because there's stability. Right? But the fact is, there is a lot of repartnering. So the problem that Mark was discovering, and he acknowledges this, is that there was so much instability in same-sex couple households. And there were often parents elsewhere, you know, a prior spouse or a heterosexual partner, that the child, the instability might have been part of the vehicle. But then he says, well, instability is going to be endogenous to a same-sex married household because um, they will have been conceived into a heterosexual couple who's still in their life. Or maybe it's an adoption and there's an open adoption. As wonderful as adoption is, we know there are more difficulties than there are in outcomes. Or there's a new reproductive technology. And we, the government, I was part of the NIH council begging to study this more but not um, listen to. Um, we don't really know the outcomes for donor children. Again, adults first. Adult, you know, the adoption law used to be, uh, you know, we do not create children for parents. We don't have, you know, you want a child, so we're going to go get you one. It's all about what the child needs. So this was completely set aside. Uh, in the case of new reproductive technologies, it's not about finding a parent for a child in need. It's about creating a child for a parent who wants one. And because, um, uh, same-sex couples will always involve a donor, and we just haven't bothered to measure those children's wishes or difficulties. Um, there is a website, there's Anonymous R Us, where children who are born of you know, donor um, situations get together and talk about whether they're okay with it or whether they're, they're troubled or even deeply so. So what I'm saying is, is um, we don't know. The best study we have, the only nationally representative study, indicates there might be problems, which is not surprising because, again, look at the studies when a child and a boy is missing his dad. You know, it, just, it would be not surprising. On the other hand, uh, especially uh, same-sex male households have a lot more money. Money can maybe make up for some of that. You could build the more social networks, good schools, better neighborhoods. You can definitely make up with some of that with money. Um, and what you can't make up for is the dynamics of an opposite sex household or the fact that the child will know and be known by um, his or her mom or dad. And then stability is a factor. Um, I've seen studies, and remember the Netherlands has had domestic partnerships since 1993, so we now have, you know, gone on 26 years. And I have seen some studies indicating that the, the instability of couples, in particular the female couples, which again, you can extrapolate from, from data that we have. Women file somewhere between 66 and 70% of divorces, right? So then have two women in a relationship. Hmm, it, maybe it wouldn't be surprising that you would have an enormous number of, of divorces um, if women are more inclined to evaluate the relationship, especially emotionally, from a little you know, higher bar. So um, 
that's sort of where we are at the moment. Um, one of was only one other study, a claim was made that it was a social stress factor, so what we're creating the difficulties uh, for gay and lesbians in the United States, and there was a big claim published in a big journal that um, it took 10 to 12 years off their life. This struck Mark Ragnaris as very odd, since like smoking a pack a day for dozens of years only takes one to three years off their life, so um, not that I'm encouraging it. But, but how could something take 10 And he went and he saw that there was a major coding error in the minority stress study and he broke the magazine. The magazine took the whole study out and said, yeah, it's a problem. And that, that the study could never be replicated despite five attempts. So it doesn't look like maybe social stress from the outside is the issue. It looks like maybe it's the actual dynamics uh, that go on in maybe the relationships and households that are causing some of the difficulties that we see that are so regularly associated uh, with, uh, with those groups. And again, that's, um, everything I said would be you know, a firing offense, by which I mean you know, guns, um, in your average um, discussion. But this is the empirical data that we have so far. Sometimes I think that just like Judith Wallerstein's book in 1990, um, which was Children of Divorce, a 25-year retrospective, Sometimes I think we'll get a book like that 25 years from now, and sometimes I think that if the atmosphere is like it is today, everyone will be too afraid to actually do studies and write about it, whatever they show. Unless, well, if they, if they show one thing, but, but nobody who sees anything negative would want to or, or could be published. That's more what I see happening. Okay, oh, one more question. This is a hot center right here of all the questions. Very interesting. Thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Ryan Wilson, Diocese of Gary. You mentioned as part of your solutions um, to um, advocate for relationship education versus sexual education. And a lot of us will be going into education as priests. And I was wondering if you could give us a little more uh, about that. I would recommend, there's a lot of good reading in this, um, I would recommend a couple things. One is there's a book by Jeff Moran on the history of 20th century sex ed. It, my gosh, we have thought so much about this. I, I wrote an article called Beyond the Sex Ed Wars. What, I, I mean, read my article called Beyond the Sex Ed Wars. I'm just going to recommend that in part because it talks about if you really want people to think about it responsibly, then it has to be in connection with the life they want for themselves. What life do they want for themselves? And, and sex and what they do with it and whether they have children when is a piece of that, you know, family life that they want for themselves. And it always has to be put in that context. People, young, the, the, I'm about, I'm, I did a paper, um, I'm, I'm doing it next week at uh, Scalia Law School called um, uh, Religion, Sex, and the Administrative State, in which I criticize both the abstinence uh, funding programs and the contraceptive mandate as, you know, over, over claiming what they could accomplish. Um, there is not great results from either the comprehensive sex ed, where they're teaching them how to use uh, contraception, or from what are now called sexual risk avoidance, which you used to know as abstinence programs. There's some effects, some programs are better than others, but there's not a lot. Instead, um, there's a program, for instance, that I feature in my article, Beyond the Sex Ed Wars, where you actually help young people learn to give the gifts that they have to give. So you, it was a program in, in California called Casa Carrera, where they had this enormous amount of, um, of like service hours. Instead of just teaching them about, here's a condom, here's yes, here's what no means, they, they engaged the gifts that different students have to actually assist people who were even um, worse off than themselves economically and in other kinds of needs. That's where the teen pregnancy rates went down. Because right? they're starting to think about what their life is going to be and think maybe they have a narrative for their life that is other than, I'm going to have a baby when I'm 19 or 18. The other thing I would recommend to me, I find it so interesting. In 94, 96, University of Chicago put out like the definitive survey of American sexual um, interests, preferences, and practices. Um, I think it's called something like, uh, 
sexual organization of the city. Oh, I can't remember the pillar. I should remember the name of it. But anyway, there's a guy named Lauman on it. Then there's a follow-up book with essays that are sort of summarizing and discussing what they found. And the happy news is that even though women prefer commitment with sex more than men, both men and women report um, their happiest experience of a sexual relationship is associated with deep commitment and love and a future. Like, it would be really nice to know, in other words, what people are really desiring um, before you teach them about relationships, isn't it? It turns out that what they're desiring has a, has a great deal of overlap with the Christian anthropology of the person's needs and desires in connection with sex and marriage and parenting. So, uh, and I, Jeffrey Moran, in his book, uh, talks about just the failures of the 20th century programs and, and talks about talking to kids about relationships. I think that University of Chicago thing, um, I think apparently the, the headline in the New York Times the morning after was sort of, America's sexual practices shockingly normal. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's not a disturbing book, and it, it puts to rest the silliness of like the Kinsey Report or the Height Report. Nobody actually is doing, you know, academic research takes so seriously. Those were self-interested, self-directed reports um, destroyed by selection effects and, and, and researcher bias. Um, but this report is now considered sort of a definitive understanding. And there's also reports that overlap with it from over 160 countries that show the human person, even when measured at a raw empirical level, has some fairly stable preferences and dispositions. They differ somewhat between women and men, but the interest in feeling permanently loved, committed to, uh, et cetera, it turns out people really like that. <laughs> um, and teaching people, capacitating people to be that and to give that is real relationship education. And then, of course, the Holy Grail, in my view, would be tying that, if you were doing it in a Catholic context, and you'll see I'll be talking about this tomorrow, um, with our identities as people who manifest Christ. So that, and this is the perfect segue till tomorrow, that is not a separate thing over there as a moralistic um, teaching, but it's rather part and part of our identity as, as Christians. I'm guessing that we are finished, unless anyone else has a question. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention and for your questions. Professor Alvarez, and thank all of you for uh, being here uh, tonight, uh, at least those of you who are here voluntarily. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, I realize that a lot of, uh, a lot of folks uh, are not going to be able to uh, uh, come back to campus for tomorrow, but uh, the Meyer Lecture tonight and tomorrow are being live streamed uh, from our uh, a good uh, 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 marketing communications department down here. So even if you're not able to come back to campus, you might find the opportunity of joining all or part of the lecture uh, series tomorrow via live stream, which I'm told uh, is available on the homepage of uh, the usml.edu website or on our Facebook page. So that may be an option for some people, but uh, uh, don't do it at work. I don't want to get in trouble with your employers. <laughs> At any rate, that concludes uh, our evening for tonight. Uh, we'll be back here again at uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And uh, certainly look forward to uh, uh, seeing you then. Again, thank you, Dr. Albert.